breaking. Um, this is a uh, this is actually a dig we did at a church building, and I flipped through some of these. They were digging a, an elevator shaft, which I'll show you here in just a minute. Right. Let's see. Where's a good picture? There you go. Um, we were actually down in the shaft, like way at the bottom of the shaft, and started seeing all kinds of bones, all kinds of rocks and things. Long story short, they uh, they had quite a bit of fossilized bones and, and teeth and things. And whoa, let's go back. Let's see. But you can kind of see we uh, we pulled quite a few out, and uh, to be honest with you, I don't know 100 sure where they are today, but I do know you know that that was kind of fun just because it was physically at the church building itself, and here underneath of it you got dinosaur bones and stuff, so that was kind of fun. All right. Get back to where we were. Any comments or questions as we continue? All right. We're going to pick up. So what we've done for the first hour is basically look at some evidence of humans coexisting with dinosaurs. Next question that I want us to at least touch on briefly is the idea of, okay, Aren't there allegedly other animals that supposedly lived long before man? Long before man was ever on the earth. And so I, I show these just for no other reason than to, to prove the fact that the evolutionary time scale is extremely messed up. So I start with this guy. He is a trilobite. And according to the evolutionists, this is what everything came from. This is what's at the bottom of their evolutionary time scale. Uh, we do believe that they're all extinct. Best way for me to describe this to you is this guy would basically look like a horseshoe crab. You'll notice on this page in this textbook that it calls this creature an index fossil. Meaning anywhere you find this particular fossil, by definition, that layer is considered to be the oldest fossil layer around, 500 to 600 million years old. So if you look here, you've got trilobites way at the bottom. Then we come up and we've got fish. Finally, we've got dinosaurs, early mammals. Man would be literally at the very top of the screen. Separated in time by roughly mm, somewhere between 500 and 600 million years. The only problem with this little story, this make-believe myth, is back in 1969, a gentleman by the name of Dr. William Meister, he and seven of his friends who were out looking for fossils, they were just amateur fossilologists, seven of his friends there to witness a particular event, they scaled up a ledge in Antelope Springs, Utah, they were tapping open rocks. When Meister hit one, it split into two beautiful halves that contained two trilobites in the sandal print of a human being. Now, guys, before you just kind of say, yeah, what, so what's the big deal, understand this one fossil basically collapses this entire column. Yeah. Because you've got trilobites living at the same time that you have men. That means you've basically effectively wiped away 500 to 600 million evolutionary years with just one fossil. And yes, I've seen it. Had them take it out of a lockbox in Texas because I've been told that you can see the sandal stitching on this thing. And guys, there is absolutely no getting around it. That This is definitely a human sandal print that has been fossilized with two trilobites in it. In fact, the guy who owns it, he told me, that he had been offered over $2 million by evolutionists who told him the only thing they wanted to do was to destroy this fossil. 
or about this guy, Silicon. Some of you guys may remember seeing images like this in your textbook. And in fact, we are still in a lot of places teaching the idea that we evolved up out of the sea and that they gave rise to land-dwelling creatures. This particular textbook is showing the coelacanth being 325 to 410 million years old. Supposedly lived in the Devonian period, long before the dinosaurs, because this guy had to give rise, allegedly, to the dinosaurs. So they put him at 325 to 410 million years old, and yet the fact of the matter is, this guy lived, did not live 325 to 410 million years old. He's very much alive today. They've been catching these things off the coast of Madagascar and India literally for decades. They call them junk fish. But here's the thing, guys. Because they found a fossil of this fish's front fin, I'm going to back up showing to you. You look right here. They found a fossilized fin. It looked like a little arm. And so the researchers assumed that he used those little front fins to crawl out onto the beach, onto the land. If you look at his back tail, his back tail doesn't look like a lot of fishes today. It's almost kind of got a pointed arrow. So they assumed this was a shadow water fish that crawled out onto the land, kind of like this guy. The only problem is, guys, we know today this fish is a very deep water fish. He lives below the 18 degree isotherm, primarily in the Indian Ocean. And, you know, it's one of those things where we found a fossil that they said, hey, this is a missing link. And so for two generations, they basically brainwashed students, teaching them that this was a missing link when the reality of it is, it's not. So then the question becomes, all right, somebody, you know, you, logically you look at all of this material that we've talked about thus far today. You look at the evidence of dinosaurs coexisting with man. You look at this evidence with trilobites and with, with coelacanths. And before I leave the trilobite, let me point out something real quickly. This guy right here, he has an, uh, let me get to him. Trilobites actually have an optical doublet eye, meaning they have two lenses. In all their little bitty eyes, they have two lenses that work together with a refracting interface in between. You have got a single lens. Optically speaking, this guy is more advanced than we are. Which, exactly, which begs the question, are we de-evolving? You know, how in the world is it that you've got a creature that has an optical doublet that's at the bottom of your evolutionary chain? Hey, Brad? Yes. Well, um, just because he has an optical doublet and we have a single doublet, isn't evolution not necessarily more advanced but better to... Uh, better to adapt and I guess in his environment he needs that optical doublet to stay alive whereas humans because of the other attributes that we have we don't necessarily have to have optical doublet uh, say that again I'm not sure I'm following you well uh, you made the point that are we de-evolving because the trilobite has an optical doublet and we only have singular well, evolution, isn't the definition of evolution just the ability to uh, change over a period of time so that the creature that's evolving uh, is better able to uh, exist in its environment? So therefore, yes. the trilobite has to have an optical doublet to survive in its environment, whereas we okay. possess different attributes that are greater than the trilobite, therefore we don't necessarily have to have that optical doublet to survive in our environment. Okay, but, but I think you're not getting the whole thing that this thing is far more complex than ours because you have two lenses that have to work together. Okay, they, they refract together. 
So why in the world would a creature start out with a more complex, evolutionary complex system that requires a lot more energy, a lot more complexity, a lot more input, rather than what we've got today? Well, wouldn't that be because the environments are totally different? Our environment's not uh, the same as the trilobites. Okay, so if I if I go to a different environment, are my eyes going to change? Um, no, but that's not necessarily where you're thriving. I mean, the trilobite isn't. Uh, well, I say, I don't, here's my question: If I go somewhere, is that going to affect my eyes? Uh, probably not. Probably not. Is it going to affect the eyes of my children? Uh, no. Why not? Because the genetic makeup's already there. Genetic makeup is already there. Okay. Ah, so Dean, basically what you're saying to me is, even though evolutionists have brainwashed you and said that maybe it's the environment, realistically the genetic stuff's already there. That stuff's garbage. Oh, I'm just asking questions. That's all. I'm not. No, I know. But I'm trying. I'm trying to get you to realize. Yeah. A creature's eye doesn't change just because he moves into a new environment. Just because there's different pressures on it, his eyes aren't going to change. So why would you, first off, evolve this complex eye? That's question number one. Question number two is why would it then de-evolve? And if the only reason you can give me is environment, you know, that this is better for that creature, that's garbage. Because your genetic material is already pre-programmed from your eggs and your sperm. Yeah. This is a quote I just pulled up just for, for fun. Lisa Schwaber, she said, Trilobites have the most sophisticated eye lenses ever produced by nature. Richard, uh, Ricardo Levi said, he said, in fact, this optical double is a device so typically associated with human invention that its discovery in trilobites comes as something of a shock. The design of the trilobite's eye lens could well qualify for a patent disclosure. And yet this is, guys, allegedly one of the first creatures out there. Uh, I was trying to make... Do what now? He's not careful with his wording. He used the word design. Yes, you caught that. Okay, so we, we obviously... I mean, if you are an honest person, if you're a logical person, you realize, okay, there's some problems with what all we've been, you know, with the evolutionary timeline, with what, what they're teaching in textbooks. But the question still remains, all right, if dinosaurs really were created with man in a six-day creation, then why aren't they mentioned in the Bible? Now, you guys can go ahead and give me the answer, and then we'll talk about it. Well, they're not mentioned by that name because the name wasn't coined until 1845. There you go. And when was your Bible translated, i.e., the King James Version into English? <laughs> Texas Receptus, when was that? 1611, brother. Yeah, yeah, 1611. <laughs> yeah. Everybody go ahead and grab your Bibles. Let's open up the book of Job. Let's learn a little bit of text today. Somebody tell me what happened in the book of Job, the very first chapter. Satan asked God for permission to get to Job. Basically. Okay. And what did he do? He took away his... God told him that he could take away his wealth and, uh, okay. and all that. So, Flox... Flocks are gone. Yeah. What was what was the next? Family. He actually, if you recall, he actually started out by attacking Job's character. Then he goes after his property, his flocks, and then he goes after what? Then he goes after his, his kids. Yeah, he killed his kids. Now, guys, I don't, you know, I don't know about you. But if I lost, let's say I lost all my wealth in one day, that would be a bad day. That would be a really bad day. But you start throwing my children in on top of that, that to me, 
you know, you, you're talking about a man who's going to be on his knees. Yeah. If that weren't bad enough, he then goes after Job's very health. Yeah. Something we take for granted every single day. We get up, we don't think about our health. He covers his head, covers him from the crown of his head, the bottom of his feet, in boils. And these are pustulating boils that are nasty, that are itchy, that are basically make it where no position is comfortable. If you sit, you're sitting on boils. If you lay down, you're laying on boils. They're on your feet, so if you stand, you're standing on boils. In fact, look with me at Job chapter 2. Somebody read to me verses 8 and 9. And he took a pot chart to scrape himself while he was sitting among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. Okay, so get the mental picture. Dude is out there scraping himself with a piece of ceramic. <laughs> and his wife looks at him and she says, Why don't you just curse God and die? And yet he doesn't do that. In fact, if you look, I love his response. You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. <laughs> Guys, that's what that's what Abraham should have said to Sarah. <laughs> if you think about it, when Sarah came to him and said, Hey, I'm old, I'm not going to have a baby. Go into my handmaid Hagar. Abraham should have looked at her and said, You speak as one of the foolish women. All right, so very soon after she makes that foolish comment, starting in that same chapter, Job chapter 2, starting in verse 11. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, each one came. And so, guys, what we're going to see in this book is this running dialogue between Job and these three friends. Now, realistically, they didn't come because they worried about it. They came because they wanted to know what he did. They assumed that Job sinned big time. If you notice, look at verse 13. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days, seven nights. No one spoke a word to him. So for a week, Job is just in misery. Nobody says anything. Well, finally, starting in about verse, let's see. Well, Job chapter 3, he basically curses his very birth. Job chapter 4, we have the beginning of this dialogue. Eliphaz jumps in and he says, Job, you've sinned somehow. Job says, no, I have. And you'll start, if you flip through your Bible, what you're going to see is a running dialogue between Job and these men. Job chapter 8, Bildad tags in and says, Job, you need to repent. Chapter 9, Job says, no, I didn't do anything. Job chapter 11, Zophar urges Job to repent. He wants to know, what did you do? Notice Job chapter 12. He basically lets them have it. He answers his critics. He says, look, I don't know why this is happening, but I didn't do anything. Job chapter 13, verse Starting in about verse 20, he requests to speak to God. He says, only two things do not do to me. Then I will not hide myself from you. Withdraw your hand far from me. And let not the dread of you make me afraid. Notice verse 22. You call and I'll answer. You let me speak and you respond to me. <laughs> He's basically telling God, God, you can speak first or I'll speak first. It doesn't matter. Now flip over to Job chapter 38. <laughs> By the way, I should ask you guys, have you already had Job? Yeah. Yes. Good. Okay. So you guys know where we're going. You also know what Job said, what God said. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, you will answer me. Let me do it this way. So, 
So, starting in Job chapter 38, God starts deluding Job with questions. Now, let me just outright ask you guys, who who teaches Job there at school? Denny. Denny. Uh, okay. Please tell me that Denny does not teach that this is some kind of a poetic portion of the Bible. No. Uh, okay. This is a real discussion. This is God really asking questions like, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? When the, when the sons of God sang? Or what about the eagle and the hawk? How do they fly? Or what about snow and hail? How do I make those? Or, or what about the dwelling place of light, Job? Where is that? And finally, in Job chapter 40, verse 15, he says, Look now at the behemoth which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now his strength is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. Now, hopefully you guys realize that a lot of Bibles have what we call footnotes in them. These are not inspired footnotes. This particular one says it's supposed to be either an elephant or a hippopotamus. But look at the text. And by the way, I would point out this is uh, Job 40, verse 16 in the KJV. Lo, now his strength is in his loins. The force is in the navel of his belly. Jerry, this is for you, by the way. Thank you. I'm starving around here for some Starving for Easter. Obviously, elephants have big stomachs. Hippos have big stomachs. That guy's got a big belly, too. When we keep reading, again, from the King James, he moveth his tail like a cedar, the sinews of his stones are wrapped together. Now, just as a uh, point of issue, when it's talking about cedars here, guys, it is going to be talking about massive trees. In fact, if you do a little word study in the Old Testament, on the screen you'll notice four different verses that are pulling out this word cedars. And remember, it was the cedars of Lebanon that were used to build the temple. These are some of the mightiest of trees. Notice, like Amos 2, verse 9, Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars. One of the highest branches of the high cedar, and set it out. Massive trees. The righteous, Psalm 92, verse 12, shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a, a cedar in Lebanon. So you ask yourself, okay, he moveth his tail like a cedar. Obviously, that guy doesn't have a cedar tail. Obviously, that guy doesn't have cedar tail. That guy is getting a whole lot closer. Uh, let's see. How about, Jerry, can you read it for me? Job chapter 40, verse 19. Yes, sir. I knew you were going to follow. My computer just went blank on me. Yeah. I'm sorry? So my computer just went blank off and asked for it. Bible is, so it might take a minute for it to come back up. Oh, there it is. Do you want to use my American standard? Uh, no, I'd, I'd prefer Jerry read it. <laughs> <laughs> I was asking Jerry if you want to use the new American standard. Uh, that, that's why I asked Jerry, actually. <laughs> well, it's inspired. Jerry, I, how about I quote it for you? He is chief he is chief in the ways of God. Now it's talking about this behemoth. Why do you think the writer of this book described him as chief in the ways of God? Because <laughs> he's the biggest animal on the planet? He's the biggest animal we've ever discovered that's walked this earth. Look Look at the description of this creature. It goes on not only to tell us, says his ribs are like bars of iron, his bones are like beams of bronze. Notice verse 21. He lies under the lotus trees and a covert of the reeds in the marsh. The lotus trees cover him with their shade. The willows by the brook surround him. Indeed, the river may rage, yet he is not disturbed. He is confident that the Jordan gushes into his mouth. This is not only describing a creature, guys. It's giving us his environment. 
The next chapter, Job chapter 41, can you draw a Leviathan with a hook? So we've got two creatures here. I don't know what you've thought about them in the past. I'm not sure what you were told about them in your Joe class. I'm here to tell you they were both real. I'm here to tell you that God is pointing them out to Job as he's rebuking him, saying, look, Job, how did I do this? How did I make? Not only does he point out the behemoth, he describes its environment to it. Look at what he says about the Leviathan. Can you put a reed through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Though the sword reaches him, it cannot avail, nor does the spear jar or javelin. Darts are regarded as straw. Bronze is rotten wood. His undersides are like sharp pieces of pottery. He spread pointed marks on the mire. On earth there is nothing like him which is made without fear. He beholds every high thing. Now again, some of your Bibles may have a footnote that this is a crocodile or an alligator. How do we know that's not the case? Because you can draw them out with a fish hook. They don't be do, do we have crocodiles or do we have crocodiles or alligators that are preserved in, for instance, pyramids? And you say, I'm not sure, Brad. Could you show us a really cool picture? Yeah. And I say, absolutely. Sure, Brad, can you show us a really cool picture? <laughs> Let's just take a look here real quick. Try this one. That is wrong. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Here we go. There we go. How about a bunch of sack of crocodile mummies? <laughs> what have you done to current science, 2002? These are mummified crocodiles that the Egyptians had preserved. The point being, guys, you know, the text here is saying that you can't catch these things, you can't put a hook in their mouth, nobody can come around them, and yet we've got mummified crocs that the Egyptians didn't have any problem getting. So what is a better description of this creature? And to me, if you look and start in verse 18, it says, as his knees and flash forth light, his eyes are like the eyelids of morning out of his mouth, come burning lights. Sparks of fire shoot out, smoke goes out of his nostrils as from a boiling pot. Burning rushes, his breath candles cold, and a flame of fire goes out of his mouth. What did I just describe? A dragon. A dragon. A dragon. Now, I know a lot of people think, you know, surely these things weren't real, surely they're imaginary. But guys, the fact of the matter is we got lots of good evidence that says dragons, whether they, they be dinosaur-like creatures that we've already discovered and they don't have a, a label on their bones that says dragons or whether they be something else, according to history, they were around here. Marco Polo lived in China for 17 years, and approximately AD 1271, he reported the Chinese emperor raised dragons to pull his chariot and parades. In the year 1611, the year your Bible translated into English, the emperor initiated the post royal dragon feeder. 
Chinese family is said to have raised dragons in order to use their blood for medicines, highly prizing their eggs. We've got physical evidence. Here you got a tribe of Indians that's carving a very dragon-like creature, actually breathing smoke or fire. You got all kinds of physical evidence. You got literature that talks about them. You got ancient artwork. So here's what I want you to think about for just a moment. Number one, would everybody in that room say the Bible's inspired? Okay. Number two, are these two creatures described in that inspired book? Yes, yes. Absolutely. So they have to be real, guys. Now, all that does is places a responsibility on me for trying to figure out, okay, how in the world do you then explain smoke and fire? Let me see if I can help you with that. Oh, yeah, y'all better be praying about Massachusetts. Seriously. Look at this guy right here. This is a parish lophilus. What's, what's the one thing that stands out? The He's got a big horn. Do we have any idea what he stored in that empty cavity? No. The answer is no. We don't have a clue. Because that kind of stuff doesn't preserve. All you've got is a bony cavity. Is it possible this guy could have stored methane and then used it when he felt threatened? Now, as a possibility, the answer would be absolutely yeah. Is it possible then that what we call dinosaurs could also have been, in fact, what they called dragons back then. The answer is yeah. Basically, all you got to have is a, a way to ignite a gas, and everybody in there hopefully knows that we got plenty of animals that will excrete large amounts of gas. Cows are the, the easiest example just because they belch loads of methane. On the screen in front of you, you see a couple of different, three different uh, creatures, all of which really defy explanation. Any of you guys that have ever had the privilege of living in the South, and I did say privilege, this is God's country down here, then you know what it means to catch a lightning bug in the summer. Those lightning bugs do not burn your hand when they produce light. It's a cold light. And it's something that to this day we're still trying to figure out how do they do it. In fact, I met a lady when I was doing a seminar. She used to get paid a quarter by Oak Ridge scientists for every lightning bug that she would bring them. She'd put them in a freezer and then take them when she had a couple of hundred. She'd take them over to Oak Ridge Laboratories because they're trying to figure out how does this thing have cold bioluminescence. I, what about somebody that says, all right, Brad, that's nice and all, that's pretty, but you, you got a problem, and that is, how in the world can you have dinosaurs living with human beings? Wouldn't they have eaten them all up? How do you respond to that? Well, the Lord, the Lord gave man dominion over all the creatures of the earth. Okay. Amen. Genesis chapter 1. What else? First half of today's class, we just went through uh, showing evidence of uh, man and dinosaurs living together. Okay. Everybody look in your Bible at Genesis chapter 1. Can somebody read to me 29 and 30, please. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, and every tree which has, has fruit yielding seed, it should be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth, 
which had life. I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. What were both man and animals at the beginning? Vegetarians were vegetarians. Guys, we were vegetarians. Now think about that for just a moment. With that right there, that one fact, ought to explain so much to you. Number one, it ought to explain how in the world can humans have dominion over and be around dinosaurs. Number two, it ought to explain to you how Noah could have gotten all the animals on board the ark without them eating each other. Number three, it ought to tell you how Noah could grab all the food needed for all the animals because after all, they were all what? Vegetarian. Vegetarian. John Clayton, who is a, uh, a member of the church, actually, you guys know of John. He said it's ludicrous to suggest that man could have cohabitated with a dinosaur. Man could not have lived in a world full of dinosaurs. Unfortunately, this guy is a member of the church. He's going out teaching. But if you think about it for just a moment. Paul made the comment, we have dominion over the animals. What does that mean? But to me, it means that we actually have an authority over God's creation. And that we can actually make God's animals use them for our purposes. So, for instance, you look and you've got things like killer whales. Or maybe you've got Komodo dragons, or you've got bears, or you've got whales. Have we been able to harness and even, you know, somewhat domesticate some of these creatures? And the answer, obviously, is yes. Let me show you this one, just so you remember. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, for every kind of beast of bird, every reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. You got dancing bears, you got lions jumping up through flames, you got men who are charming cobras. I mean, you know, when you think about it, is it a stretch to think about us having dominion over these creatures? The answer is no. All right. Let's talk about this for just a moment. Somebody says, Brad, we learned in our Job class that Job was probably one of the first books written. <laughs> but when do we think the events of Job actually happened? Before the flood. Oh, yeah. Before the flood. Before the flood? After the flood. I'm sorry. <laughs> How about after the flood? I forgot. Yeah, after the flood. After the flood. Yeah. What does that mean? Guys, if you've got God creating man and dinosaurs on day six, you've got to point out the behemoth, the Leviathan, after the flood. You add to it all of the evidence that I just showed you. What does that mean as far as the ark? Dinosaurs had to be on it. They had to be on it, guys. Now, whether you like that or not, you know, the fact of the matter is, two of every living creature that had the breath of life in it were on that boat. Now, how can we get them on there? Brad? Yeah? You get them on there by uh, taking the kids. You by taking... Yes, take by taking juveniles. Yeah. Absolutely. You think about, you know, we know dinosaurs came from eggs, obviously. But the point being, could Noah have taken juvenile animals? Absolutely. Wouldn't it make a lot more sense for him to take, for instance, a small calf and, you know, two cows, but that are smaller calf-like? Because they don't eat as much. They aren't as big. They don't take up as much room. They don't produce as much waste. So is it possible that Noah could have taken two juvenile dinosaurs? Because what was the what was the main job of the animals when they got off the boat? To multiply and 
fill the earth? It was, absolutely, it was to replenish the earth. So you would want to take animals that had a long reproductive life in front of them. You don't want to take senior citizens. All right. Last question. What happened to them? Now, again, when I give a seminar, I make sure folks know we really don't know because that's the truth. And the truth is not something we need to be ashamed of. It's not something that we need to be scared of. I do put up a joke with people and just show them some of the uh, theories that are out there. Um, obviously, most kids have heard about the asteroid that hit the Earth. There's a theory that maybe it was an exploding star that flooded the Earth with its radiation. There is a theory that the Earth's climate became too warm, too cold, too dry, too wet for the dinosaurs' health. There is a theory that the dinosaurs' diet resulted in weakened eggshells that broke after being laid. And sad to say, no fiber really is a scientific theory. There's a theory that a laxative plant, the dinosaurs' diet disappeared, and they all died of constipation. Now, what do you guys think happened? People get grant money for that? Believe it or not, they really do. What do you guys think happened? Global warming. Man probably killed him. Okay. Man probably had, a, had something to do with it because anytime we fear animals, what do we do to them? Kill them. We, we kill them. We hunt them. When was it that God said, okay, now you can eat meat? After the flood, the Noah, the Noah covenant. Absolutely. Genesis chapter 9, if you look specifically in verse 3, he says, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I've given you all things, even as the green herbs. So after the flood, God says, you know what? You can fire up your barbecue. You can enjoy whatever you want. I actually think, I don't have any kind of proof of this, but I actually think they probably had some, used some in a... Uh, food source kind of environment. I also think the change of environment after the flood made it where that they did not thrive as much. You know, if you go from a pristine, what God called very good creation, to all of a sudden him raining down all kinds of, of destruction on sin, not only was it a, a global flood, guys, it changed our weather patterns to what we have today. The fact that the Sahara Desert is now a desert, it's heating up. You've got two poles that are now extreme, extremely cold. We'll talk a little bit in our, our last class together about the fact that the Ice Age was kicked off because of the flood. So you've got an Ice Age that's in effect. The, the animals, cold-blooded animals, cannot run around as far. So they're limited as to where they can go, where they can thrive. you got people that can now eat them. People may be scared of them. Well, it makes sense. Yeah, eventually they're going to be taken out. And I think that's what happened to them. Comments, questions, thoughts? Could the change, you in, got the, it. Could the change in geography after the flood help out a little bit, too? Absolutely. Train. What happened there, John? What are you talking about? Well, basically the formation of the, our current, what we see today, the, the topography or the how the mountains formed of uh, our oceans, our current oceans, and uh, you know land mass, uh, as the waters opened up from underneath and above. From underneath, we created our, oh well, God created what we have today as far as our geography. You have rougher terrain in some areas, and you know, you have boundaries, limitations uh, uh, where people can or cannot go, right, and animals and cre uh, creatures. Where, where did the water go? Pardon me? Where did the water go from the flood? Uh... Uh, probably a small amount evaporated, but uh, probably the majority went okay. down, down under, into the earth. There's, there's three places. And also stay three on places. top of the land. Water cycle of the you got, you got trillions of gallons above you. Okay? 
Because remember, God called, formed a, a wind blue. So you got water in the atmosphere. You've got water under your feet, as John said in the water table. Dean, read, uh, read for me Psalm 104. Starting with verse 5. No, I'm sorry. Start, yes, yeah, starting in verse 5. He established the earth upon its foundation so that it would not totter forever and ever. Keep going. Through verse, through verse 9. He covered it with deep as with a garment. The waters were standing above the mountains. At your, at your rebuke, they fled, and the sound of your thunder, they hurried away. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to a place which you established for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass over, so that they will not return to the cover to cover the earth. That's pretty awesome. Verse 10. <laughs> it's amazing what you find in that book, you know? Uh, the text there basically is telling us that after the flood, guys, God changed the topography of the earth. He stretched the mountains up. He pulled the valleys down to the place which he established for them that the waters would not cover it again. So, you know, when somebody says, hey, Brad, how do you get water from the flood above Mount Everest? My point is Mount Everest was not as tall back then as it is today. You got a, a piece of scripture literally telling you that God pulled mountains up, he stretched valleys down to help accommodate some of the water. All right, let's look at a couple other things. There is a place where you guys can go if you ever want to take a uh, field trip that is fairly close to you. It is called the Dinosaur National Monument. My understanding is it is on the Colorado-Utah border. And if I can get my... There we go. Okay. Hopefully you guys can see that. Uh, there's what you're going to see when you pull up to it. Again, it's probably about a, I'm going to say about a two and a, do we what now? We don't have anything we're looking at. Oh, let's try again. Oh, let's, let's, okay. So, it's about a probably two and a half, three hour drive from you all. When you go there, what you're going to see are just hundreds, and I mean hundreds of bones that have been fossilized. I mean, if you look there, you got a backbone of a creature up here at the top. These are rib bones. These are either leg bones or arm bones right here. You've got a pelvic bone down here. All just all over the place. <clears throat> now, here's how if you go into that, that building that I just showed you. Let me back up and show you this. You want to go when this particular little center is open. Because inside, you're going to see this picture and the description of why you see all of these hundreds and hundreds of bones that have been slammed up and fossilized against limestone. Here would be their explanation. A seasonal flood. Guys, does it make sense that a seasonal flood would do that? How about a global flood? I mean... Remember, we're talking about animals that are up north of a hundred tons. How you got? If you've got that much weight, number one, either you can you can survive it, or number two, you're going to float because you got a bunch of blubber and you're just chilling in the water. But the point is, even they recognize it took water in a massive cascade to fossilize these creatures the way they did. Another thing that I want to show you is right, we'll start right here. This is a, a, another kid's book. Millions of years ago, dinosaurs were on the earth. There were dinosaurs on the earth, 120 million years. All of them disappeared before the first humans ever lived. Last of the dinosaurs died out about 70 million years ago. It's important to keep in mind that dinosaurs lived on this earth 
for at least 120 million years. According to the most recent discoveries, humans have lived here for only a few million years. You got Ritz crackers getting in on the, the act. Arby's getting in on the act. All kinds of books. We already talked about this one. This is the one that I want to show you, though. This is a Prentice Hall science book. And the reason that I want to show it to you is we ask the question, how important are dinosaurs to the whole evolutionary cause? So we open up the book. And on page 10, we got a picture of dinosaurs. On page 16, we've got dinosaurs. On page 25, on page 28, on page 29, on page 36, page 38, page 39, page 46, page 66, page 96, 97, page 98, 99, page 100. Guys, out of 100 pages, 32 of them contain information or pictures about dinosaurs. That's a third of this book is selling the idea of evolution using dinosaurs. That's why what we're talking about today to me, is very, very important. Any other comments or questions? Um, I have a question going back quite a bit uh, to the yeah. trilobite. Uh, yes. Was that, uh, was that naturally a, a land-dwelling creature? They think both land and water. Huh. Okay. Kind of, yeah. it's, a, it's a hard shell like a mollusk. Good question. Other question. I'm going to show you guys a short little video. Actually, I may show you two of them. Um, I got to think about where it is, though. I may just get it on YouTube. I got it on my computer, but I'm not sure where it is, so bear with me for just a second. Oh, wait, I know how I can get it. This first one that I'm showing you, just to give you the background on it, um, I was asked to come up and, and do a seminar at a congregation in Virginia, and they asked me if I would come a day early and tour the, uh, just a second, tour the, the new museum that they put up. Said, hey, no problem, that'd be fine, whatever. Um, so they set it up where I was going to basically take some homeschoolers through their museum and point out the errors in the museum. Well, the guy who did it, his name is Johnny Robinson, he got really, really fired up, and he said, you know what? What we ought to do, you guys know Johnny. That's really yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah. He said, uh, what I want to do is I want to call the media and let them know that we've got a scientist going through the museum that's pointing out the errors. And so he did. Um, they kicked us out. They literally would not allow us to go into the museum. Um, hey, Brad. And I'm, yeah. I can assure you that's not proper Virginia hospitality. <laughs> 
That's the that's where you get your spunk from, huh? <laughs> that explains a lot, you know. <laughs> Let me see if I can find this. Is Johnny still there in Danville? Yeah, to my knowledge. That guy has something else. You know how he spells his name? How? No, that's what I'm asking. Uh, J O H N N Y, I believe. Oh, that's going to drive me crazy. All right, let's do this. Let me put up the other one first. I'll see if I can search while it's showing that. Okay. Hopefully this will transmit by video. If it breaks up, let me know. Here comes. I'll turn it up as loud as I can. Show it to you again. <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen that. Oh, I thought it said that. Can you see oh, it? Oh, I thought, yeah. Brad, we thought we were asking if you asked us uh, if we could see it. And we said yes. Oh! Oh, I thought, okay. Let me go back. That's all right. Let's try again. Take two. of students with your intellectual posturing. Are you okay? I'm here to test your hypothesis. 
you're a studying of biologist, are you not? Well, in your lecture, you argued for the genetic origins of crime. Biology determines behavior. Well, I'd like to debate you on that. Only in this debate, the stakes are real. If you win, I let you go. If I win, that's part of the proposition. What proposition? The issue resolved. There is no valid reason why I should not kill you. Debating for the negative, that's the problem. <laughs> or the affirmative, the Australian. DNA determines our behavior. DNA has no morality. It's abnormal. Your DNA is abnormal. Abnormality has to do with statistical averages, Professor. Not right or wrong. Society agrees killing is wrong. Society is another word for statistical average. We're not all from the same gene pool. <laughs> that doesn't make it right. And it doesn't make it wrong. Our species won't survive if we allow killing. You won't survive. I will. <laughs> Me. Your <laughs> idea. You're a sick man. Your mind is diseased. folks basically trying to get across the idea of um, you know professors will say one thing in a classroom you know we're just a bunch of genes that we can't help anything whatever but when it really gets down to it they don't believe what they're teaching uh, because if they if they did then like the guy was showing you know, look, if, if you're willing to say that I'm just a bag of genes and I kill you, then there's no reason for me not to do that. Um, questions, thoughts on that one? I did find the other one. So, let's bring it up.
This was, uh, I think this is it. toilet paper on him and have people in the back room calling insults. I had a guest on here that you guys totally humiliated, Dr. May, uh, on and on and on. So you you're guys basically treat, giving these treat treat like, why you started treat. acting like that. Here we go. Y'all ready? Johnny's going to eat this guy up. I mean, I'm going to say I can make it bigger. Sure about that one, guys. I will. Uh, I'll see if I can't have it pulled up better for you next time we get together on Thursday. But long story short, they kicked us out of a uh, museum. It was kind of fun because the new camera showed up, and the museum security basically closed the doors, would not let their cameras in. Which, you know, to me, that's pretty telling. If you if you're an evolutionist, what have you got to hide? So, um, questions or comments from today's material? You should already be read up through in the book, up through chapter, well, up through page 256. How are we coming on our papers? You ready to turn them in? Done, yeah. done, buddy. Okay. Let me, uh, let me see if we can't. What do you guys need? A password? Is that all you need? No, sir. I think you have to put it in as an assignment. You have us enrolled in the class. Oh, okay. Why don't we do that right now? Do you guys have the password to get in? Uh, I don't think we need one. We don't really need one. We didn't need one. You enrolled us for us, so... Uh, we don't need that. Okay. All right. All right. All right. You can see. New assignment. Here we go. All right. You guys should be able to do it. In just a moment. Uh, I'm going to call it Major Paper. And we'll say that it is due. I'm going to put the start date. What is today? Today is the 19th, I believe. Mm -hmm. 19th. Okay. Okay, I'm going to put the start date of the 19th and the last day of the 24th. Actually, we'll say that. Do the 26th, so the last day will be. The... All right. There you go. You guys should be able to get into it now. Thank you. Next time we're going to be talking about uh, things like the flood. We're going to talk some about things like um, starlight and time, ice age, radio carbon dating, that kind of stuff. Look forward to getting your papers. Y'all take care. Thank you. Thank you.